Well, good Sunday evening to you, all of our Shiloh family, as well as other family and friends. Thank you so much for joining back in with us tonight to be a part of our Sunday night worship service online and time in the Word of God. We are appreciative of the opportunity to be back together. We ask you to continue to pray for those of our Shiloh Church family, as well as other family members and extended family, praying for God to continue to touch and meet those needs that there are among our church, uh, both spiritually and physically. And I would even say financially, we ask God to meet all the needs of our Shiloh family and extended family. We ask you to continue to pray for all of those who are battling COVID-19 out on front lines, especially among our medical personnel and others uh, with those first responder type jobs. Let's lift them up and let's also continue to lift up our nation that is in much need of a revival. Will you pray with us, please? Father, thank you for the privilege to be able to share together tonight uh, a few moments in the Word of God. We are appreciative of those who join in and support these online services. Um, it is critically important uh, that we are together in some form or fashion. And though we know that the online is not as good as being together, we're thankful at least for this. Father, we ask you to continue to bless those of our church congregation and our church family and meet the needs, whether they be spiritual or physical, and also, as we mentioned, financial. We pray this for the Shiloh family and our extended families. We do ask you especially minister to those that are out there in those first responder type jobs, God, Bless them in a special way as they battle COVID-19. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to ask for revival. And we do ask for revival for the United States of America. Thank you, Lord, for all of your goodness and your mercy. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me also remind you tonight, before we get into our time in the Word, please remember that we really need you to continue your giving. And uh, it's so critically important that we don't fall behind in our obligations. But especially right now, our missions giving uh, really needs uh, to uh, come up and improve because we don't want to not be able to continue to send the support to the field to our missionaries. So please, if you would, um, be sure that you are doing your missions giving and uh, following through with that. And if you're not supporting missions, then this would be a good time for you to think about uh, getting on board with sponsoring a missionary or helping out in supporting missions in some other way. If you've got any questions on that, you can contact Sister Nora Lucas. She'll be happy to tell you how to do that. We're looking in the book of Revelation tonight, chapter 2 and verse 7, one verse of Scripture. And we want to just kind of pull a few words out from there um, to talk about what we want to share with you. And here's what Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes. That's the phrase I want to focus in on. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him who overcomes. You'll hear me mention this several times, but I believe according to Scripture, we are ordained and called to be overcomers. The Bible says on many occasions such wonderful encouragements, things like we are more than conquerors. And so it tells us, thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we've been called and ordained as Christians to be overcomers. But We've got to remember that though we are ordained um, and called to be overcomers, we're the ones that still will determine where we will do the things that we need to do, not do the things that we should not, that would either help or hinder in our being an overcomer. For instance, the Bible says that we have been called to God and we've been ordained to bear fruit, but yet there are some people that are not bearing fruit. So that lets us know that though God is called and ordained, we have to follow through in obedience. So I want to speak to you tonight for just a few moments on this thought of helps to be an overcomer. Helps to be an overcomer. There are many wonderful things that are promised uh, in the Word of God to the overcomer. Several times 
Um, there, it's mentioned right in the chapter that we pull our text verse from tonight, and that's Revelation chapter 2. I won't take time to unpack all of these, but just to kind of give you a brief overview, just of the ones that are mentioned here, some of them. Verse 7, our text, uh, to those who overcome, they'll eat of the tree of life. Verse 11, those who overcome shall not be hurt by the second death. Verse 17, those who overcome uh, will be given some of the hidden manna to eat. And at other places in Scripture, you can see uh, where there are numerous promises to overcomers or to those who overcome. Nevertheless, I think we must all admit that though God has called and ordained us to be overcomers, the enemy certainly does not want us to walk that out. He doesn't want us to be obedient in walking that out. So he's going to be very busy at trying to keep God's children from walking as the overcomers that God has ordained us to be. So in order to be those overcomers that we're called to be, I just want to share a few things that um, we'll call, <coughs> excuse me, helps to being an overcomer. Helps to being an overcomer. The first one that I want to mention to you that is a help to being an overcomer, that will help us to do that, is that we must have no confidence in the flesh. Now, we just talked about this recently, how that we must have our hope and our confidence and put our trust. It must be in God, not in ourselves. <coughs> Pardon me. Philippians 3 and 3 says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So one of the helps to be an overcomer is that we must have no confidence in the flesh. Why? Because we talked about it recently, the flesh will fail us and the flesh will let us down. The flesh will lead us astray. The flesh will get us in trouble. And I can go on and on there. So we've got to have no confidence in the flesh in order to be one of those helps to being the overcomer is to have no confidence in the flesh. Why? The flesh is to be put off. The Bible's very clear on that. We're supposed to put off the flesh. We're supposed to put on the things of Christ. And the flesh, as I've already mentioned, will betray us. And all of us know that from firsthand experience. So one of the first things I mentioned tonight as a help to be an overcomer is to have no confidence in the flesh. Now then there's a second thing I'll mention, and that is that we have to starve the flesh. Uh, it's not just enough to not have any confidence in the flesh, but we have to starve the flesh. Romans 13 and 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Making no provision. How many times have you heard people talk about going on a camping trip and uh, they would talk about the provisions that they needed to prepare to take ready? A lot of those provisions are food to feed themselves. Well, we're to make no provisions for the flesh. That means that we are not to feed the flesh, but we are to starve the flesh. Once saved, we need to, to remember, once saved, there will be two natures that are sort of at war against each other. I've mentioned uh, references like this before. That's why on one occasion, one of the apostles, one of the apostles wrote, um, the things that I don't want to do, I do. The things that I want to do, I don't do. Uh, what was he talking about? He's talking about that striving there of two natures. Um, that old sin nature that wants to try to be resurrected, and then that new nature that we have uh, been given by being truly born again and repentant of our sins. So those natures will always try to strive against one another. And so once saved, we need to recognize there will be two natures that will war against each other. So we need to remember that we must no longer feed the old nature, which is the flesh. That's the old nature. Uh, the new nature is that of the spirit man. The old nature is the flesh man, if you want to put it that way. And so we need to think about that we've got to starve the flesh and that we must no longer feed the old nature, which is the flesh. So we need to really understand that's got to be done. A third thing I'll mention as a help to being an overcomer is that we must feed the new nature. Now, that's opposite of starving the flesh. We must feed the new nature. First Peter 2 and 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So it's important what we, what we desire and what we partake of uh, to help us either grow or not grow. 
one person pointed out this, and, and it really makes sense when you think about it. They said that, you know, we just talked about we've got to starve the flesh. Now we're talking about feed the new nature. One person pointed out that you really cannot feed both at the same time because in reality, um, what starves one feeds the other anyway. Think about that. What starves one feeds the other anyway. And so we need to understand that things of the world um, can starve the new nature. That's why old things are supposed to be passed away. All things are to become new. That's why um, our lifestyle is to change. Our vocabulary is to change. Our conduct is to change. Um, our desires are to change. Our thoughts are to change. All of these things are now supposed to be based upon the desires of the new nature. And so things of the world that we're to let go of, um, those things will starve this new nature. And so we need to not feed the old nature. We need to starve the old nature. And one of the best ways to starve the old nature is to feed the new nature. So how do I feed the new nature, Pastor? Um, I, I like to go back to these three mainstays that will help you feed the new nature and starve the old nature. First of all, time in his word. I cannot overstate the importance of that. Time in his word. Secondly, time in his house. And though I know that that has been uh, limited in person lately, thank God we're getting back to some in-person worship. We're grateful for that, excited about that. Um, but it is important to try to be together and to be in his house. But when we can't have those times of being in his house together physically, we need to take advantage of times just like we're doing right now. This right now is time in his house, virtually speaking. No, I know it cannot completely offer everything to the 100% degree that being in person does, but we need to take advantage of what we can have. And so I challenge you, time in his word, critically important, time in his house, also critically important, and then time on our knees, very important. We've got to be people in the word, people in his house, and people in prayer. So things to help feed the new nature, which is very helpful in starving the old, is to have that proper time in his word, time in his house, and also time on our knees. And so we need to remember to do that. Another scriptural reference that tells us one of the helps to being an overcomer is to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5 and 16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, I want you to take note of that. Walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that's another prime example of how that you're not feeding both at the same time, how that when you walk in the Spirit, it is part of starving that old nature, the flesh nature, because he says if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The truth of the matter is to walk otherwise, to not walk in the Spirit, which is walking in the flesh, to walk otherwise than walking in the Spirit is detrimental to the spirit man. Walking in the flesh, trying to let or allowing the flesh, the old nature, to try to resurrect itself and pull us back into old habits and old thought patterns. Really, to walk otherwise than walking in the spirit is detrimental to our spirit man. Because the, uh, the truth is, as we have received Christ, we're told as we've received Christ to, to walk accordingly. And how was that? By faith. So that ties back to where numerous times we're told in the scriptures that we are to live by faith. We must walk by faith. So walk in the spirit. I've had a lot of people that have tried to ask me at times, what does it mean to walk in the spirit? And uh, we could just, man, we could preach a series on that. And we have in the past at times. But walk in the spirit simply means to be led of the spirit. It means to be in the book that was um, anointed and in and the book that was you know, inspired, the book that came by the spirit of God's moving on men of old. To walk in the spirit, you've got to do what we talked about previously. You've got to be a person that's in the word and being in his house and being underneath. All of those help us to be able to walk in the Spirit, which is following the Spirit's direction, following the Spirit's guide, following the Spirit's warnings. All of those are part of walking in the Spirit. It means that we let the Spirit lead us in our daily lives. 
Another thing to help us that is a help to being an overcomer is to mortify the deeds of the body. In Romans 8 and 13, it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let me read that again. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We must crucify that flesh. That's why we talk about the importance of that second definite work of grace received by faith, which is called sanctification. That is, that is something that greatly helps us in, in feeding the new nature and starving the old nature, in walking in the spirit rather than walking in the flesh. And we've got to do those things. Greatly helps us in mortifying the deeds of the body. This means to bring into subjection the wrong desires of the flesh. And you can't do that on your own, depending upon the flesh anyway. We must have the anointing of the Spirit of Almighty God. So it means to bring into subjection the wrong desires of the flesh. Numerous times you've heard me say that I, I love to quote those that, that uh, verse that says, you know, um, you know, casting down wicked imaginations and bringing under subjection, you know, anything that would try to exalt itself against the things of Christ and God. That's what it means to bring into subjection wrong desires of the flesh. And secondly, this will require the empowerment of his spirit, as I've already mentioned, for us to do so. And that's why we so critically need daily uh, to be yielded to the leading of the spirit of almighty God. And then I'll give you one more that is uh, one more, one last, what I would call help, one of the helps to overcome. And that is lay aside every weight. And that thought comes to us from Hebrews 12 and 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, um, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Uh, I want you to note, you can see even in that reference itself, people often try to uh, just sort of, uh, limit that thing of laying aside those weights, they considered the weights to just be sins. Well, if you notice that verse that I read, it really gives you the insight that there are weights that can hold you back that wouldn't necessarily be sin within itself. Notice the reference again. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's telling me that some of the weights that we need to lay aside would be sin. But it's telling me that there's some things that can weight us down, hold us back, get us off track, that they within themselves would not be a sin, but by letting them have the wrong priority in our life, then they become the sin of not prioritizing the things of the Spirit. So the weights are not limited to sins only. It can be things that fill up our time to the point where we don't have our priorities in order concerning the most important things, which are spiritual. You hear me talk a lot about how that I believe God's people should enjoy life more than anyone. You hear me talk about how that uh, I, I'm an outdoorsman. I, I love to hunt, love to fish, love to do things outdoors. Um, and some people have some uh, some other hobbies that wouldn't be the same as mine. Listen, there's a lot of things that that the things within themselves would not be sin. But if you let them take up your time to the point that you no longer have the time you should have for God, time in his word, time in his house, time on our knees, then the thing that's not sin within itself, we now allow it to become sin because it is now keeping us from having our spiritual priorities as they need to be. That's why I don't believe it's a sin to go fishing, but I believe you can let fishing become a sin as getting a wrong priority. Uh, the same with hunting or other sports or so many different things that the thing within itself would not be sin. But if we allow it to just uh, take up so much of our time that we don't have time in the word and time in his house and time on our knees, then yes, the thing that within itself is not a sin. Guess what? It's now become sin because it's now become one of those weights that becomes a sin by getting in the wrong or getting our priorities wrong. And putting other things ahead of what we should have time in, with God and in God. 
then it becomes sin. So we got to be careful and we got to lay aside those weights. So I believe that all of these are, are helps to us to be the overcomers that we need to be. Uh, we've got to have no confidence in the flesh. We've got to starve the flesh. We've got to feed the new nature. We've got to walk in the spirit. We've got to mortify the deeds of the body, and we've got to lay aside every weight. All of those things, I believe, are necessary to walk out being the overcomer that God has ordained and called us to be. I call them helps to being an overcomer, helps to be an overcomer. We need to remember what they are. All of these helps, they're all helps to assist us to be the overcomers that we are ordained and called to be. Nobody wants you or me to live as God has ordained us to live, and that's as overcomers. No one wants that more than the one who ordained us to do that himself, and that is Almighty God. God is for you. God wants you to be fully surrendered. He wants me to be fully surrendered to him. He wants us to know how to apply these helps to our life. He wants us to be the overcomers he's called us to be. I want that for you as well, and I want that for myself. May the good Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. I love you. Dad and I appreciate you so much. We're so glad to be a part of the Shiloh family, and we're so glad that you are too. God bless you. Please uh, tune back in and join with us again on Wednesday night at 7. God bless you. I hope to see you then by way of our online service.